Welcome back in Genesis chapter 34. That's where we find ourselves today. And this is a, uh, there are maybe chapters of the Old Testament, maybe of the book of Genesis that you aren't as familiar with. This might be one of them. Uh, this is a very, let's say this is a overall a rather dark moment. Um, a very violent moment in the book of Genesis. And we sort of find out at least some of the reasons why, and we see some behavior that is going to show up later uh, in the life of Jacob's sons, at least the life of some of his sons. But in Genesis chapter 34, we have the, the Dinah incident, or the defiling of Jacob's daughter, Dinah. Beginning in Genesis chapter 34, says, Now Dinah, the daughter of Leah, whom she had borne to Jacob, went out to see the daughters of the land. And when Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Hivite, prince of the country, saw her, he took her and lay with her and violated her. His soul was strongly attracted to Dinah, the daughter of Jacob, and he loved the young woman and spoke kindly to the young woman. So Shechem spoke to his father Hamor, saying, Get me this young woman as a wife." And Jacob heard that he had defiled Dinah, his daughter. Now his sons were with his livestock in the field, so Jacob held his peace until they came. So Jacob's daughter Dinah was away, uh, it seems, visiting some of her friends who were apparently from one of the local cities right there around where they lived. And while she was away, Shechem, who was the prince of that region, he saw her, took her, and lay with her. As we're going to find out as we not only as it mentions here, but as we go through this chapter, we're going to find out that very likely what Shechem does is it's very likely that he rapes her. It seems he takes her against her will and has uh, a sexual relationship with her, very likely against her will. Uh, So this is very likely he forces her into this relationship, rapes her, and then Shechem falls in love with Dinah. And he urges his father to make arrangements for him to have her as a wife. Now, Jacob and his sons have already heard about what's happened when Hamor and Shechem approach. So the text continues on. It says, Then Hamor, the father of Shechem, went out to Jacob to speak with him. And the sons of Jacob came in from the field when they heard it, and the men were grieved and very angry, because he had done a disgraceful thing in Israel by lying with Jacob's daughter a thing which ought not to be done. But Hamor spoke with them, saying, The soul of my son Shechem longs for your daughter. Please give her to him as a wife, and make marriages with us. Give your daughters to us, and take our daughters to yourselves, so you shall dwell with us, and the land shall be before you. Dwell and trade in it, and acquire possessions for yourselves in it. So apparently, Hamor and Shechem were holding Dinah captive, Because the next time she appears, it's when her brothers take her out of Shechem's house. So, kind of get the picture here. Shechem has this inappropriate relationship with Dinah, it seems, rapes her, and then keeps her at his house. And then he goes to Jacob and Jacob's sons to sort of make this arrangement. So, just kind of get that picture in your head. The fact that he did, a, as it says, a disgraceful thing in Israel by lying with Jacob's daughter, it also says a thing which ought not to be done, to me is pretty solid evidence that Dinah was raped uh, in this, in this uh, chapter. So Hamor, though, Shechem's father, he's wanting them to marry amongst themselves, but he is thinking of the economic benefits. You know, He tells them to dwell and trade in the land, acquire possessions for yourselves, Hamor, as we can see, his eye is, and we're going to see this more in a moment, his eye is on the wealth of Jacob. And so then Shechem says to her father and her brothers, let me find favor in your eyes, and whatever you say to me, I will give. Ask me ever so much dowry and gift, and I will give according to what you say to me. But give me the young woman as a wife. But the sons of Jacob answered Shechem and Hamor his father and spoke deceitfully because he had defiled Dinah their sister. And they said to him, We cannot do this thing to give our sister to one who is uncircumcised, for that would be a reproach to us. But on this condition we will consent to you. If you will become as we are, 
If every male of you is circumcised, then we will give our daughters to you, and we will take your daughters to us, and we will dwell with you, and we will become one people. But if you will not heed us and be circumcised, then we will take our daughters and be gone. We will take our daughter and be gone. And their words pleased Hamor and Shechem, Hamor's son. So the young man did not delay to do the thing because he delighted in Jacob's daughter. He was more honorable than all the household of his father. So Shechem uh, discusses this with the sons of Jacob, and he is willing to pray, to pay you know, whatever bride, pi- bride price, this is typical of their time, whatever bride price is demanded by Jacob and his sons, Shechem is willing to pay whatever it takes. Now remember, and we saw this back when uh, Abraham's servant was searching for a wife for Isaac, the brothers were typically involved in helping their sister find a husband. So the fact that Jacob's sons are involved here is pretty typical, pretty normal for this time. This is their sister, and the brothers would be involved in seeing that in their sister's future wedding and their in finding a husband for their sister. But Jacob's sons reply deceitfully. They had, as we're going to find out, they had other plans. The only price they demand is for every male of the city to be circumcised, and we're going to find out why here in just a moment. So, Hamor and Shechem hear the price, and they return. And Hamor and Shechem, his son, came to the gate of their city, and they spoke with the men of their city, saying, These men are at peace with us. Therefore, let them dwell in the land and trade in it, for indeed the land is large enough for them. Let us take their daughters to us as wives, and let us give them our daughter. Only on this condition will the men consent to dwell with us, to be one people. Here's the condition. If every male among us is circumcised as they are circumcised, will not their livestock... Now notice what is said here. Will not their livestock, their property, and every animal of theirs be ours? Only let us consent to them, and they will dwell with us. And all who went out of the gate of the city heeded Hamor and Shechem his son. Every male was circumcised, all who went out of the gate of his city. So Hamor and Shechem convinced the men of the city to be circumcised, and the incentive is we will marry their daughters, and our daughters will marry them. And ultimately, the primary incentive is, hey, they are wealthy, and eventually, by us marrying into their family, eventually, their wealth will become ours. That's really the incentive here. Is This, this is, now remember, remember the great wealth that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had. Uh, they have camels. Remember, camels during this time was like a, you know, they were status symbols of wealth. Like uh, we might think of, you know, private jets or, you know, yachts today as status symbols of wealth among the wealthy today. Camels were one of those status symbols of this time, and Jacob had those. So Jacob is immensely wealthy. It's like, hey, we have an opportunity to marry into the family of this, you know, multi-millionaire, perhaps even multi-billionaire, eventually some of that wealth is going to come into this city and it's going to stay here. So they see what these folks see. They see the opportunity for themselves to become, as a people, as a city, immensely wealthy, which means immensely powerful. That's all they see. That's what they're thinking. Now, as the text continues, though, we find out why Jacob's son spoke deceitfully. Now, it came to pass on the third day when they've been circumcised, when they were in pain, that two of the sons of Jacob, Simeon and Levi, Dinah's brothers, each took his sword and came boldly upon the city and killed all the males. They killed Hamor and Shechem his son with the edge of the sword and took Dinah from Shechem's house, and they went out. The sons of Jacob came upon the slain and plundered the city because their sister had been defiled. They took their sheep, their oxen, and their donkeys, what was in the city and what was in the field, and all their wealth. All their little ones and their wives they took captive, and they plundered even all that was in the houses. 
Now, being circumcised is a very painful thing for grown adults, for grown adult males to go through. And while they were still in a tremendous amount of pain and so unable in many ways to function, uh, Simeon and Levi arrive and they kill every single male of the city. Uh, They take Dinah out of Shechem's house. Now, something you might remember is that Simeon, Levi, and Dinah were all Leah's children. So Simeon, Levi, and Dinah were all full-blooded siblings. You know, some of these, a a lot of Jacob's children, they all had the same father in Jacob, but Jacob, you remember, had two wives, Leah and Rachel, but he also had two concubines. So he had had children by four different women. But Simeon, Levi, and Dinah, they were all Jacob's children, and they were all Leah's children. So they were all full-blooded siblings. And Simeon and Levi, Dinah's full-blooded brothers, are the ones who show up, kill every male in the city, and who get Dinah out of there. Now, killing every male, as we're going to see in a moment, as we saw from, uh, from what we're about to read, they carried away. We're about to see that they carry away, uh, it says, their little ones and their wives. So killing every male in the city does not include the male little ones, only the males who were old enough to be circumcised. So every male that was old enough to be circumcised, they killed. And so the sons arrive, the rest of Jacob's sons arrive, and they carry off the people and the valuables. Every valuable possession, all the children and the men's wives, they take them as captives. Now, just something to keep in mind, in in the Bible— in narrative accounts like the book of Genesis, the narrator is just telling what happened. Very rarely, although sometimes this is the case, very rarely is there a comment given along the lines of this was wrong or this was right. So we're not, because that's not what the narrator's doing here, we're not necessarily told What happened was absolutely right, was just. What happened was absolutely wrong. It was unjust. It was just, here's what happened. And so then, as the chapter closes, then Jacob says to Simeon and Levi, you have troubled me by making me obnoxious among the inhabitants of the land, among the Canaanites and the Perizzites. And since I am few in number, they will gather themselves together against me and kill me. I shall be destroyed, my household and I. But they said, should he treat our sister like a harlot? So Jacob, as the chapter closes, Jacob is upset because Simeon and Levi's actions, specifically killing all the males, might have brought the disfavor of the people of the land upon them. And remember, Jacob is not a man of war, as we saw from his dealings with Esau. Jacob is not a mighty warrior. You know, he's not... Whereas Esau is kind of pictured as this mighty warrior, Jacob is not that way. Jacob is a, a man, you remember, even as it described them growing up, Esau was the mighty hunter. Jacob was the one who was, we might say, the more civilized, the one in the tent. Uh, so Jacob, he's not looking for a fight. Simeon and Levi, though, simply respond to their father, should our sister be treated like a harlot? They believe that their actions were justified. So, what are we to make of their actions? What are we to make of the actions in this chapter? Well, certainly, Shechem's actions were sinful. He took Dinah, and it appears very likely raped her. Certainly, what Shechem did was wrong, was sinful. Certainly, Dinah was taken advantage of, and she was wronged. Not that she did wrong, but she was wronged by Shechem. So certainly, Shechem was in the wrong. But what about Simeon and Levi? There are some different thoughts. One commentator, this is Michael Whitworth in his book, The Epic of God, he wrote, he said, I thus contend that Moses meant for, in recording this, Moses meant for Simeon's and Levi's closing words to be a warning to Israel's tribes. If there is sin in the camp, it cannot go unpunished, or the moral fabric of a godly society will quickly unravel, Ecclesiastes 8.11. So perhaps that's what we see here. There's a warning. Sin must be dealt with swiftly, and it must be punished appropriately, or 
the, the society devolves into chaos. Perhaps that is what's going on here. Another uh, commentator, another uh, translator note in the NIV First Century Study Bible, in their Bible notes, they pointed out that this story makes no comment as to the morality of Simeon and Levi's actions. We have only Jacob's strange blessing in Genesis 49, in, excuse me, in Genesis 49, verse 5, which speaks of Simeon and Levi's intense violence. Yet, from Levi, the priesthood was born. So if you go look at Genesis chapter 49, verse 5 through 7, here's what Jacob, as he's on his deathbed and he is pronouncing these blessings upon his son, I think Jacob's blessing upon Simeon and Levi is the most telling piece of evidence we have about this situation. Genesis 49, verse 5 through 7. It says, Simeon and Levi, pairs them together, are brothers. Instruments of cruelty are in their dwelling place. Let not my soul enter their counsel. Let not my honor be united to their assembly. For in their anger they slew a man, and in their self-will they hamstrung an ox. Cursed be their anger, for it is fierce, and their wrath, for it is cruel. I will divide them in Jacob and scatter them in Israel. So here's my thought. They did bring justice upon the offender. Shechem, justice is dealt to Shechem for what he did to their sister. But in their anger and in their cruelty, they killed people who had nothing to do with the crime. And it seems, Jacob's blessing upon them at the end of Genesis 49, they pay a price for their anger and their cruelty. They are both, both Simeon and Levi, ultimately are scattered within the nation of Israel. Levi doesn't have, while the rest of the tribes, or the most of the rest of the tribes of Jacob, the sons of Jacob, they all have their plot of land. Levi just gets cities scattered throughout the nation. Simeon even does at first get its own piece of land. It's down there around Judah. But eventually Simeon is just absorbed into the tribe of Judah. And they just, they, they essentially as a tribe sort of, in a sense, go out of existence. Or their existence is paired along with Judah's. So they do bring justice upon the one who did the crime. But at the same time, they went far too far. And they were very cruel in their anger. So, as this chapter wraps up, beginning with this chapter, we notice something that we will continue to see, or we will see again. Jacob's sons often act cruelly toward others, and they take advantage of others. While the justice of Simeon and Levi's actions can be debated, what is clear is that they were very cruel in their actions, and they benefited significantly from their cruelty. They took the wealth of the entire city for themselves. Now, where does that lead them? Ultimately, their cruelty leads them to, in a few chapters, selling their own brother, Joseph, into slavery, and they end up living for years and years with this guilt and regret of what they have done. So their their anger, their cruelty is going to play a very prominent role in the chapters to come. So I appreciate you studying Genesis chapter 34 with me. As I said, this is a a very bloody, a very dark chapter in the book of Genesis, maybe one that you're not that familiar with. But we begin to see the character of Jacob's sons emerge, and that's going to be a, a, a factor in what is to come. But thank you for studying this chapter along with me. Lord willing, next time we will be in Genesis chapter 35, and we will see that God is going to bless Jacob and sort of officially give him a new name. But until then, I hope you have a good rest of your day.